Howdy, y'all. Welcome to Toot Sweet Social Club. That's at Toot Social. Join us. Log in. We would love to hear your questions. We'd love to hear you live. The more people, the better. Today, we are here talking to these fine gentlemen about the Zap Festival coming up. That's the Zinfandel Advocate and Producers Festival in San Francisco, and it is wild. Two years ago, I went. I couldn't find a place to park, but I hear they're getting a lot better at that. It is the largest festival in the world, as I understand it. It celebrates one varietal. Um, and so that is a big deal. And Zinfandel has got a special route here in California and in the United States. And these gentlemen all know a whole lot more about that than I do. Um, I, again, I'm Ian Wyden from 7 by 7 Magazine, and we are a proud sponsor of the Zinfandel Festival this year. So once you, give, once you go around here, you guys can all introduce yourselves, and uh, then I'll give you a hard time. My name is Clay Mortson with Mortson Winery in Dry Creek Valley. Uh, hi, Kent Rosenblum, uh, formerly with Rosenblum, uh, and now uh, Rockwall Wines in Alameda. Uh, long story about that name, but uh, there we are um, in the heart of the wine country uh, in the Bay Area. And uh, anyway, we sort of specialize in older Vines and Fendels and Mountains and Fendels, as a lot of these guys do. They're, really? They're, I thought you specialized in Civil War history with a name like that. <laughs> he, he, you know, just call me General Kent. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> All right, we got the General. All right. Oh, All right. right. Hi there. I'm Chris Lamy. I'm the winemaker for Montevina and Terra de Oro wines up in Amador County, up in the Sierra Nevada foothills. And I'm Joel Peterson. And I'm the Ravenswood winemaker, you know, General Plunky, and kind of do everything, travel all over the world kind of guy. All right, travel all over the world. Where's your favorite Zin from? Oh, my favorite Zin? My favorite favorite Zin is from Sonoma, California. It's gotta be Sonoma, right? Yeah, gotta be Sonoma. Way better than I Napa. disagree. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, the Amador is really good, but let's just say that uh, Sonoma has a slight historical edge on Amador, only by probably microseconds. But still, you know, we were you know like where Zinfandel was first planted in California. All right. You know, Zinfandel was one of those amazing grapes that made its way all the way from Croatia through Austria to New York to that hotbed of grape growing in New York, Long Island. Uh, and in fact, the place that first arrived in Long Island was named Ravenswood, which I always thought really? was like this amazing kind of coincidence. What a coincidence. And then it came to California around 1851. There were probably several introductions of it. You know, uh, Frederick McCondry was one. Uh, there was Zinfandel and there was something called Black St. Peter's and it was the Black St. Peter's was obviously the that same as Zinfandel. Like there is no Black St. Peter's around <laughs> here. And then it came to Sonoma. And uh, it was planted in Sonoma and Napa, actually. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and really took the world by storm. So by 1888, there was 34,000 acres of Zinfandel planted. There are 55,000 acres planted today. Wow. So it, it, it is like a very important grape. It is the second most planted red grape in California after Cabernet Sauvignon goes back and forth. It, it yeah. keeps our wine industry in California moving along. If yeah. there wasn't Zinfandel, we wouldn't have an industry. And as I understand it, it's actually, it was the Americans that called it Zinfandel. It did come from Europe, but it was a Bostonian uh, who put it in the newspaper trying to sell some of it. And he's the one who coined the term uh, Zinfandel. I got that from y'all's press release. I he misspelled it. Yeah. Well, he misspelled it. Yes, he? he did. And so did we change it back or did it forever misspell Well, he, no, he misspelled it and we changed it along the way. Okay. <laughs> and I, I can tell you, we are forever grateful that he changed it to Zinfandel because yeah. his Croatian name was Zerlianac Kastelanski. Gesundheit. Or the other. <laughs> or, the other <laughs> or the other was even worse. It was Tribidrog. It oh. sounds like, you know, some kind of orc out of Middle Earth. Or something you, know? you need to put ointment yeah, on. Yeah, well, I exactly. think there was a Zinfandeller that sort of came from Germany or Austria. Somewhere Well, there's, there's, a, white, there's a white wine in Austria called Zinfandeller. Zinfandeller. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And, yeah. you know, it could be the mixed up labels. I mean, who knows? Oh, uh, but, uh, yeah, yeah. And, if, yeah. in fact, he didn't even spell it that way. It was called, it was, I think he called it Zeeperdill. Uh, yeah, I know. It was like not Zinfandel. But huh. here, here's the neat deal. This we call this our American, our California original grape, right? Zinfandel came here. Very clouded history, but where else does it grow in the world? Hardly anywhere else. And there's really two grapes that are California's own: Zinfandel and and 
Patisserie. Patisserie. All right, you guys. All right. I'm going to say white Zinfandel, but that's my answer to everything. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Pico coming. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a good yeah. answer to a lot of things. Actually. Yeah. Uh, I think wine is. I was actually up until a fourth morning last night enjoying some Zinfandel. Oh, I've been, man. I've been regretting it and sweating oh. it out all day, but um, I feel better now that i got a little bit of hair of the dog to chase it down. Yeah. Well, you tell me a little bit about Zinfandel in general, like the characteristics versus, say, uh, Cabernet or something else. What is Tell me about it. What is what's, what makes Zen is Zen? Well, I think one of the things that is most underappreciated about Zinfandel is just how difficult of a varietal it is. You know, we always joke around you know, war maker that says that Pinot is the most difficult wine to make has simply never made Zinfandel. And I, I think from that perspective, there's such an amazing appreciation for it because I think we all sitting here believe that wine is made in the vineyard. That's a common vein in all of our wines is a sense of place and terroir. And if you truly believe in that adage, and there's no doubt that the Zinfandel is, is a much more difficult wine to make. So to create a balanced Zinfandel that has bridal freshness, that has structure, acid, integrity, it's a much greater accomplishment to me than making any other wine. It's a bigger berry, bridal, it's thinner skin, it's prone to rot, it ripens unevenly, it produces unevenly. And so there's so many challenges that represent it. So to make a truly great expression of place that has bridal freshness is, is a I think a challenge that we all enjoy and really adhere to. And I think, but I think that Clay's point is exactly right. It is a difficult grape, which is probably the reason it's not grown anywhere else but California, because California has exactly the perfect environment for it. This grape went halfway around the world to find the right environment. All the rain happens during the winter. It's dry and warm during the summer. It doesn't rain again until late September, early October, sometimes later than that these days. Uh, but that's exactly what this grape needs. And it's found the kind of sparse volcanic soils um, that, and the, sort of the head printing that keep the crop levels in balance. It's a fairly large grape, but you've got to keep the clusters as small as you can, and you've got to keep the crop levels well in balance. And we have the climate and the conditions here that make this the perfect grape. But, but the beauty. Beauty. The beauty. The beauty? Uh, beauty and the beast. Yeah, okay. I'm not sure. Where's the beast? The beast. <laughs> uh, is that it grows so many places well. Yes. Yeah. And, and, Chris, it, and, Chris make, and from make different wines. Amador, in each area. Clay, uh, Rockpile up on the mountain, yeah. uh, Joel, everywhere. Uh, <laughs> You're growing yeah, it everywhere? everywhere? I'm growing it everywhere. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Have you looked in my ear? Sub Saharan Africa. <laughs> So yeah. a little bit more about the festival. By the way, the festival is January 31st through February 2nd. and there My birthday. Which one? February 2nd? February 2nd. All right. Well, that'll so be exciting. Stop by. Wish me happy birthday. Yeah, you absolutely should. And you should definitely check out the festival. So the Zap Festival goes from January 31st through February 2nd. But there are a lot of different things going on. There's the uh, Epicurio, which is a series of different really food-related events. Are any of you all really kind of versed on that portion of the... Uh... It is probably the... In my opinion the hidden gem of the of the zap uh weekend um it's 50 wineries 50 restaurants doing amazing food and wine pairings it's it's stunning um the 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 incredible amount of food incredible amount of wine and and each winery works very hard with their restaurant to find the best match that they can and it's uh it, it's a treat it's um, great value. Great value for... What's, what's the price? Does anybody know the exact price? Dollar. I see here that this is the, uh, the, the Epicuria Day is January 31st, so it's the first That's day. That's the Thursday. Thursday, 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 Thursday night. evening. Kicks off Thursday night, yeah. Yeah, I think, it, I think $60 strikes the... M much more like 100 yeah. Oh, 100 <laughs> It's worth like yeah. 500 Whatever it is, it's a killer yeah. value. And much more than like 100 are. I mean, what, what's really nice about it is it's, it's intimate. It's actually yeah. smaller than the large event. And you get to meet the chefs, you get to meet the winemakers. Most of the winemakers are there pouring their wines. Yeah. We have plenty um, of time to talk. And to yeah, I got plenty of time to talk. And the crowds are not huge you know, because we sort of keep it, you know, uh, manageable. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's, it's really a lovely thing. Oh, that sounds really good. That sounds really good. And that moves on to flights. These are forms of flavor. Wow. Um, it's February 1st from 10.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. I can talk about, about that because uh, I am actually... You can talk about just about anything. Right? Uh, apparently, <laughs> yeah, I can. You know, like, you know, you want to you talk about the uh, the arc of a meteor through space? No. That sounds perfect. Yeah, it sounds terrific. No. Uh, <laughs> Get into some physics. Actually, I, have, I can talk about that because I'm moderating the panel. Uh, and I've got this wonderful panel. Uh, I am, I am, we are doing a ZAP Historic Vineyard Society uh, joint effort here. 
Okay. And the Historic Vineyard Society is a group Now, you're not of, smoking anything, right? Mm, it's not that kind of joint, Kent. I know that's the first place that people in Alameda go when they need sucker, but, you know. I just had to check that out. <laughs> and, and the... Uh, the Heritage Vineyard Society is a, uh, society, or the Historic Vineyard Society is a vineyard society that's dedicated to preserving old vineyards, documenting them, and trying to uh, keep them in the historical record. Uh, and so a vineyard that's over 50 years old, in their opinion, is a historical vineyard. Uh, it turns out that about 50% of those vineyards uh, that are very old, in fact, many of them planted before 1900, are Zinfandel. Uh, so there are four panelists who are pouring four wines uh, from four different regions. So we've got Mendocino, Sonoma, Napa, and Lodi. Uh, and we've got people like Tegan Pasolacqua, who is the, I got to get that one out of the way quite quickly. Yeah, it's hard to say. Again. Yeah, it goes with uh, and, <laughs> As and, you can say. And he's, Tegan, Tegan is the uh, winemaker at Turley these days, but he's also doing the Lodi section. He just bought a vineyard himself in Lodi, so he's very dedicated to the Lodi idea. My son, you know, Morgan, who has uh, got Bedrock Winery, is doing the Sonoma section, very historically versed on old vines. Uh, he is um, the, uh, he, he actually is working on his master's, master of wine thesis, and it's all about old vineyards in Sonoma. And uh, we also have um, Bob Bialy from the Napa Valley. He's going to do uh, four wines from uh, the Napa Valley, which is, you know, fabulous. And we also have Mr. Mendocino, you know, Dennis Patton, uh, who's been around for a gazillion years. And he's got, <laughs> yeah, really lovely Isn't wines. Isn't he invented a tank or something? Yeah, I think so. You know, I think he, you know, so he's doing some very interesting wines from Mendocino. Uh, so we'll do that. It's a, uh, two flights of eight wines a piece. Uh, and those, uh, wines, uh, will be paired, um, you know, with pictures and with their historic perspective. So you get a whole idea. So this is the this is kind of the more serious section of Zap, but it's also a great deal of fun because you learn a huge amount uh, about old vineyards in California, and uh, these are really treasures. I agree, and I'll say just to speak to the event. Um, I was on the panel last year for flights, and it's a blast. It is. So much fun to sit there and share the knowledge that you have with a couple hundred people who really dig this and are having a great time. Yeah. And it's very interactive. You've got wine winemakers and people who do this with passion and love for a living. And they're just, we're having fun up there, um, kind of just like this, uh, except we aren't drinking quite as much. Yeah, and, speaking of which. And, uh, <laughs> and it's, it's a blast. And I would highly recommend anyone who's got that slightly nerdy side about wine, come and check it out. It's it's um, it's all the fun of Zinfandel and a lot of knowledge too. Yeah, and you can impress your dates and all that stuff. It's really Absolutely. important. Even a little bit of wine knowledge. If you're the one at the table with it, man, you end up looking good. So, uh, any of you guys have any good stories about Zin? I know in uh, Scotland, from Scotland or yeah, I mean it's uh, the first time I tried it was for um, it was for a holiday in Scotland. Put up our Christmas tree, um, and first about the first of December, second of December, put up our Christmas tree, and we opened a, a Californian Zin. I can't remember what it was. You were four or five at this point. Four or five at the time, and uh, <laughs> and we stopped putting the Christmas tree up because the wine was so good. It's like the tree can wait. You know? <laughs> but what I was going to ask you, you talk about food pairings. Um, some of us doesn't know so much about wine. What are your favorite food pairings with Zin? Me directly, I think these oh, gentlemen yeah. could probably tell it better, and it, for me, it's always really dependent on the Zinfandel itself. But I find that it pairs so easily with just about anything. However, I tend to break it out with the barbecue. A lot of the Zins really hang hang well with barbecues, but um, but I find it pretty versatile. What about you guys? You know, I'm a I'm a carnivore, so I love it with meat. I think when you can, especially on the barbecue, you get a little bit of that smoke characteristic. And you tend to, whatever you tend to season your you know meat with, if you're cutting a barbecue, mm -hmm. then you get a lot of spice to it. And I think speaking for the people here at the table, you know, we all make Zinfandel that have great balance. And so when you have acid, you know, I love to do Zin with a ribeye, something that has a lot more marbling in it, a lot more fat, because mm -hmm. I find if you have well-balanced Zinfandel, it can cut through the 
and you can take <laughs> take that. Spice <laughs> 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 That was the sound of the ribeye. He just finished the bottle. Of the <laughs> just, and, uh, I wouldn't seriously <laughs> call a paramedic. <laughs> that was, yeah, we, 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 we just broke it. Okay. <laughs> Woo! But then, it, I mean, it is a really versatile food wine. Um, I mean, one of the funnest things we've done at the winery is, you know, done a, a Zen dinner. You know, we pair Zen with every course, and you know, had the opportunity to do it with Chef Charlie Palmer. And, you know, to take something like tuna and pair it with Zinfandel and you do like a, you know, black pe- pepper crusted tuna, I mean, it was absolutely magical. So it is a dynamic food wine, but I think the key, as someone said, is that it's about the, that particular wine. Right. And starting with balance in the vineyard that translates to balance in the wine, which makes it pair well with food. Talk about that a little bit. In terms of the vineyard, I mean, everybody's always talking about terroir, which I know is a combination of weather and earth and all those things that really kind of make the wine what it is. What exactly is it? Like, what are the flavors of Zinfandel that you hope for that are going to come from that? Ken, I think you ought to handle that. You made 23 single vineyard designated Zinfandel. Uh, we're, oh, yeah, now, we're, now that your last name is Rock uh, Wall. Man's the wall. We're rocking. Um, okay, I'll, I'll address that. I just want to say my favorite thing is butterfly leg of lamb, Meridian. Garlic and, on the land. garlic and olive oil and white wine. And I, I'm, I'm a vegetarian, grilled. so, you know, uh, you know, my favorite thing is... Well, I'm a veterinarian. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, they, they mean I, the same thing, right? I hope by right? this time I mean, you, you have found out there's a difference between dogs and food. <laughs> you know, because if you confuse them, it gets really ugly. That could get bad. Yeah, yeah. you've got to shave one of them. That's about the only difference, right? I, know. I, have, a, I have an interesting story about that, too. <laughs> uh, about shaving it? All right. <laughs> anyway, um, so you, you can do, like, ginger, curry, you mm-hmm. know, things. There are all sorts of North African dishes that have got exotic spices. Lebanese dishes that are just horrific with Zinfandel. They love the kind of spicy, aromatic, uh, sort of round fruit character. Uh, a lot of these dishes, you know, kind of absorb the intensity and the flavor characters of Zinfandel beautiful. Yeah. 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 A big Z, you know, and everybody says, what's a big Z? And, a, you know, and alcohol is this big problem. Well, I don't think alcohol is a big problem. <laughs> That's um, a solution for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can be, it's like a cheap date, you know, but... Roughly uh, about 14% in solution. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We've got some writers. Give or take. Are in the you but, and Sherlock. Uh, to go back to the question about what makes individual vineyard sites special, um, you know, we, we kind of find red soil is, uh, is a really neat component. Uh, high up planting, mountaintop. Uh, these old vines, you've seen old vines. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Small. I mean, it's, it's so dramatic. And, you know, the production on those old vines is, what, play uh, a couple tons the acre. Yeah. Low. Most, uh, low. Not uh, the profitable. Not, no, no. If you were to plant today. But on the other hand, to pull it out and replant costs so much. Um, it almost might as well go with it and try and charge us winemakers like four or five thousand a ton. Have you been working with my brothers? <laughs> <laughs> I think so. I think so. I have a quick question. What do you consider an old vine? Because I see that on many labels and it says oh. old vine then. Oh, we're, so, into, we're into the tricky wicket on that one. Uh, well, no, no. See, I had a guy come around to zap tasting. He says, I'm doing a survey on what do you think old vines are? Uh, and I said, well, I think it's pre-prohibition. He said, well, you know, I, I've just been going around, and there was a guy, and uh, he said, I've got 10-year-old Zinfandel, and I've got 3-year-old Zinfandel. He says, I call my 10-year-old Zinfandel old vine because it's older than my 3-year-old Zinfandel. <laughs> I said, wow. <laughs> Okay. Um, well, Historical Vineyard Society uses 50 years. They use, they use yeah. 50 years. I think that's right. a pretty yeah, there's a, generally yeah. accepted okay. you know, age. But the unfortunate thing is, is there is no regulation by the TTP on the label. So someone is within their legal right to put old vine on a wine that's made from a two-year-old old vineyard. Ultimately, They're not morally correct in our opinion, mm-hmm. but ultimately there is no regulation on the term. Which is unfortunate. Ultimately, yeah. it's like the internet. It's up to the uh, audience to, you know, call them out and make that. Uh, and and in, in truth, you know, Zinfandel is 
really does have old vines and really ancient vines. Mm -hmm. uh, so that while there is some confusion at the, the younger end, we've got wines on the table. I mean, for instance, the Teldesti was planted around 1900. I think that qualifies as old vines. Right. Uh, That's not have, ancient vines? Yeah. What does it take? Yeah, what does it I, Well, I don't know. Ancient, ancient is somebody, somebody's machination. You know, we've got vines in Sonoma Valley that were planted on the first rootstock that came into California after the first blocks were in California. And those were planted in, you know, 1885, 1884, 1886, 1887, 1888. So those are really old vines, and they're producing, you know, like two tons, two and a half tons an acre. Uh, and, and in fact, those vines are being taken care of again. And something like Old Hill Ranch being taken care of by Phil Hattori, uh, and it's all organic. Will Buckland, you know, is like the owner of that vineyard now. And the vineyard looks like it's 30 years younger. You yeah, know, here, it looks like it put grapevine extract on its, uh, on its, on its leaves. Yeah. Well, I, I have something that I think the winemakers here at the table can agree. Mm. There's a definite <laughs> flavor yeah. that is old vines and fundal. Yeah. And, I'm, and what I've tasted, tasting different vineyards, it's not necessarily tied to a number of years. I know vineyards that are 40 to 50 years old that have old vine flavor. And I know vineyards that are upwards of 70 that still have that vibrant, bright, youthful Zen flavor without that depth of complexity that you find or that my definition of old vine is. And I think that's the, the part that's so cool about Zinfandel is that that location is so important in developing that extra flavor, that extra little bit of, I don't know, whatever. I mean, it's I, wonderful. I've, I've been on a couple different panels where I always seem to be the antagonist about old wine versus, you know, planting versus terroir. Because, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think as winemakers, a lot of times we tend to um, talk about the size of our mouth. We, we talk about what benefits us. And you think about Cabernet, you think about Pinot Noir, where people love to talk about, you know, I have this special clone, or I have this Dijon clone, or I smuggled this clone in from the Latosh vineyard. You know, there's a lot of that. We're talking about Peter's Church. Or St. Peter's Church. So, but when we think about clonal selections and we think about those kind of things, you know, when these vineyards were planted in the early 1800s to early 1900s, we weren't concerned about berry size or promoting, you know, looser clusters. They were concerned with getting as much yield as they possibly could. So, while old vines, I think, have mature root systems and have lower yields, and in my opinion, that's the positive, you know, I think Kent has certainly set the bar, and we've certainly proven from our rock pile property that you can make wines that have as much of a sense of place with this incredible structure and balance as any wine in the world off of relatively young vines. Mm -hmm. And so root maturity to me is the key to that you know, that puzzle and root maturity has so many different variables from what rootstock you're planted on to what the water retention in the soil, how deep the, the hard pan is. I mean, there's so many variables that go into it. So, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, it's such a subjective thing. And as I said, I think we tend to, uh, I know. We tend here, to use I know. Actually, here's, here's, I a, here's, I a thought. here's a thought. Okay. I'll you get your thought and I'll get my thought. All right. Well, then, then I have one. <laughs> and you have a thought too? I'm an antagonist. Like I said, all right. you know, you got to get a look at all right. We're all, all right. antagonists. Has it's anybody just... ever seen an <laughs> old vine? There will vineyard. be no question. <laughs> it's not about all right. We're good. And uh, just to break it up, uh, I'm going to say right. welcome everybody to Two Tweet. If you can, if, for all of you that I see logging in, welcome. Uh, yeah. We're talking about the Zinfandel Festival Zap coming up January 31st. Through February 2nd. I am a Zinfandel expert, and these gentlemen here are here to learn from me. Um, have, well, that'll make it easy. In the background. Go. Yeah, so I will be uh, sharing my insights. We've got a wonderful audience back here. Two masters of meat in very different ways. James is one of them. He's, <laughs> uh, he's a vegetarian, so he can speak to that a little bit later. Um, but uh, yeah, so we're talking to these guys about the Zinfandel Festival, and right now we're just about to start a little boxing match about really the, the the truth about you know old vines versus uh, new vines. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, yeah. I believe your turn to start. All right. Well, here here's my observation, which probably everybody else has observed. Uh, do you ever see an old vine taller than about three feet? Sure. Yeah. No. <laughs> no. Maybe four. Feet. No. These are these are. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. These are all uh -oh. short little stout vines. Um, and uh, I, 
I read an article somewhere or someplace sometime that if you train a vine up on a long stem, it won't live more than 30 years. I definitely can, you know, dispute that because our vineyard in the front of the winery was one of the first <laughs> Cordon pruned vineyards in Dry Creek Valley and was planted in around 71. Okay. So it's 42 years old so now. Not 100. It's it's not 100. No, but I mean, you said 30 years old. Well, let me, let me re re let's say 50 or something. Well, I mean, uh, guess uh, what? Yeah, in eight years, it'll be 50 years old. I know, I know. Yeah, but the majority of old vine vineyards right are these little yeah. stout vines with little short stumps and kind of a big head train kind of deal, right? Is that right. the majority? Does anybody know any 100-year-old vineyard that is on a wire trellis system that no. is about... No. Or, does not anybody on, know not that? Not on a trellis. Not on a trellis. I, I All right. agree. Does anybody think they're, uh, you know, that system is going to be there in 100 years? Oh, we don't, I guess we don't know, but we, we, we don't know. We'll, we'll that's make the best part. You know, the, well, I hope the, we're there to check it out. The one, right? the one problem that you have is the same problem we have in Australia <laughs> with vineyards like that. And the problem no. is, you know, is, is dead arm or <laughs> eutypha. Mm -hmm. uh, and so vineyards like that are much more susceptible to eutypha. Wait a minute, I want you to type it. I'm not very good type of Well, that's understandable. You can't Never. You hit the caps very often. Okay. <laughs> so we had a couple so, of questions back here. We're well, I, I got, well, I got, I got, I got, 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 got a response to Let's Claire. It. It's actually Let's not, a, it's not so much as a, as a it's, 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 what Clay is talking about when he's talking about young vines is young vines that are managed effectively and very hard. That's a very good and point. And the key to point. making no, no, great I totally wine agree. is as all point. great wine is the balance between the climate, the vine, the vine crop, the vine leaves, the vine roots, and the soil, and all those things working together. The difference between young vines and old vines is that young vines are incredibly exuberant. You know, they're, they're, they go through this adolescent period, particularly Zinfandel, where sometimes it wants to be bigger, and sometimes it wants to produce massive quantities of grapes. And so you really have to be very proactive about how you prune and how you thin, and how you take care of that vine. And sometimes yeah. it's petulant. And sometimes and, and it complains a little bit too. And and it's and it's more erratic in its behavior. The difference between I think Clay will probably agree, the difference between that and old vines is old vines tend by their nature and because they're old and decrepit like me, you know, they tend to produce less on a regular basis. They tend to um, be kind of more consistent in their production. So they're more kind of ex to get more of what's expected out of, them, out of them. So the work you do in the vineyard is, is easier. And so you're more likely to get a good wine out of old vines than you are out of young vines. It's not that it can't be done with young vines, it can, but boy, does it take a lot of work. For those of us who are old and lazy, we like old vines because you know they make our life a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. I think, I think a point about old vines also that we need to remember is there's this double-edged sword. Are the vines, um, is the wine so good because the vines are so old or are the vines so old because the wine is so good? Well, I think you're exactly if, right. If, if that's, if, if the spot, that's a t-shirt, Chris. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Damn. If, if anybody steals that, I'm suing you. <laughs> Immediately copy. Yeah, because... If, you know, the spot that we have in Amador County that was planted in 1881, if that, if those vines didn't make good wine in 1892, they would have ripped that out and run sheep across that. And more, more importantly, if they didn't make good wine during Prohibition, it would have been gone. It would have been gone. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. so, and, and so the, these spots, there's special things about the soil, which comes back to the point that Clay said, where whenever you know, these old, old vineyards finally meet their maker. I'm really excited and hope I'm still alive to see what the next vineyard planted on top of that soil do, because it'd be fun to see what that spot does with very young baby vines. It may, it, it's probably not going to be what we're getting off these hundred year old vines, but boy, I want to taste it at least at the beginning. That's but, probably all the time I have. Yeah, you know, but those historic vineyard society is going to make sure that none of those vines go away if we're lucky because those vineyards will be taken care of and they'll be 
kind of brought into perpetuity and but, but the vines can't live forever. No, but you can take out parts <laughs> of the vines and replace them, and so you're, you're constantly kind of yeah. keeping that yeah. vineyard going. <laughs> <laughs> and for all of you watching, we know you're out there. Ask us questions. Get involved. We'd love we to hear from you. We have questions back here. We got some questions back here, which probably <laughs> won't be as good as yours, but we were going to get to those. No, I'm just kidding. But we please do interact, join in, we're, or tweet about it. We're at tweet. We're at Toot Social. Here we are, at Toot Sweet. Let's get some questions from back here. Uh, first, I have to say I am a fan of the Angular <laughs> So my question is, okay, for that, I see we have all red bins here. Are there white bins also at that? <laughs> 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 so Don't I hold your breath. Uh, <laughs> well, tell us what is well, the problem yeah. with well, this I have, white uh, bin? I have a, uh, I, I have an answer. Yeah. If you stop by my table. Um, I might have a very pale red Zinfandel available, <laughs> <laughs> like very pale, like like it's pink and it tastes like strawberries. Uh, and I think delicious. we're going to have to get. I think we're going to get the Zinfleece after you, Chris. Your table. I mean, <laughs> just, I mean, if you, it, it might not be there. I don't know. You, you know, okay. stuff like well, yeah, why yeah. I asked, there are rumors of this white bin resurgence, and recently at a Napa restaurant. Um, I was served blindly a glass of white Zinfandel. Can you hear me? I was served a glass of white Zinfandel, and I didn't know what it was. I thought it was a rosé. It was dry. Yeah. It was pink. It should be. But that's not white Zinfandel. That's no, rosé. That's, that's, that's Zinfandel rosé. That's Zinfandel rosé. Okay. That's well, well Zinfandel, white Zinfandel it's, it's is, could be. It's by could definition, be. sweet and bubbly. And, and it's an is because it's on the menu, and it's this one right. of these things. And so there's this rumor of this resurgence of white thin, but is it true? Or is well, it just a all right, rumor? here's uh, Chris's neighbor, Renwood, and, um, you know, an Amador, uh, wonderful Zinfandel area, is going to be coming out with a sparkling white Zinfandel. Really? Yes. My own son. It's going to be delicious. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> we, we, we make a rosé from <laughs> our <laughs> rock pile vineyard, yeah. the Saunier, to get more concentration of fruit. Um, but it is a dry rosé. Tell us, what is a rosé exactly? Would you, would you just, I mean, you're saying you make a rosé out of zen. Will you tell the audience what that means? There's a lot of different ways to make rosé. Um, we make our rosé as a saunier at the winery, and so as soon as we crush the grapes, we bleed a percentage of juice off of the primary fermentation to create concentration in that tank. And instead of just dumping that juice down the drain, we ferment that juice to dryness. Okay. Uh, whether it's Zinfandel, Cabernet, I mean, you can make a rosé from a saunier from any varietal. And in the case of white Zinfandel, or you know, some people that make dedicated rosés from a varietal, the whole cl whole cluster press. They're red, so they take a red varietal and treat it more like a white wine. They, so they pick they it earlier. Purists, get flavor. purists actually pick it earlier than they would pick a red grape, and they put it whole cluster into the press. And they okay. press it so that you get very little color out of it, so there's just this kind of pale pink salmon-y color that comes into the wine. And that's yeah. what you'll find with the white zin I'm referring to, which may or may not be underneath the table. No, no. Exactly. <laughs> when, when we, but, how however, is. Well, listen, yeah. mine, mine is definitely done in a, a white zin style. Um, there's a definite sweetness to it. It is um, more dry than some of the big, big hitters in the white zin world. So you actually, it's not sticky, syrupy sweet, but it definitely has that bright, nice bright acid of a young fermented of a young picked Zinfandel and enough sweetness to balance that and definitely give you a, a taste of just bright strawberry cola. Let me, let me just yeah, let me say, give you a little historic perspective. Uh, on this. Oh, maybe because you're going to say the same thing. thing. I'm going to oh. say. Okay. Right, same time. Well, well, it's funny about so that. we've been doing Zap for what, 15 years now, Ken? 16 years? And this is the 22nd annual. 22 years. 22 years. So we've been doing Zap for 22 years. So when we started, you know, Zap, uh, you know, Ken and I were in the first sort of wave of you know, producers over there. We had to make a decision. Nobody knew anything about red Zinfandel. The most common question that you got in your tasting room or when you're on the road is, this can't be Zinfandel, it's red. <laughs> Zinfandel's a white grape, isn't it? White Zinfandel. I mean, and we were all going nuts because we knew how good red Zinfandel could be. So when we uh, started, you know, Zap, it was really to sort of promulgate the idea that Zinfandel actually made great red wine. We didn't want it to, we no longer wanted it to be the Rod, Rodney Dangerfield of wine. We, we wanted it to be 
recognized for one of the truly great wines of the world, not just one of the soda pop wines of the world. It's not that that doesn't serve a function, it's not that it's good, and it's not that people don't like it, but there's this other category of red wines that is lovely, and they're Zinfandel, and uh, there's a whole group of people now that make them. When we started this organization, how many people did we have in the first tasting? We had like 15 or 20 people in the first tasting. We now have 300 wineries, so they're, it's, it's grown. So let's it's talk about that. The 300 wineries, they're at the Grand Tasting. So the Grand Tasting yes. is an event that I've attended. It was fantastic. I got to try, I mean, tons of zins. I picked some favorites. I joined some wine clubs that day. Um, it's, it's an amazing experience. It was for me, at least, because I got to try so many things. And even sitting here, I tried three different bottles, and they've all been completely different. There are certain yeah, characteristics yeah, yeah. Let me that remain. Let me just say one thing. Yeah. Going, going back to uh, the white zin craze. Uh, we are really so blessed that all it happened because all these old Zen vineyards did not get pulled out. They went to a thousand dollars a ton for Lodi White Zen, you know, Zen for White Zinfandel, and uh, Sonoma and all these places. Thousand dollars a ton? Boy, you were paying. You're you're paying too much. You're paying like three <laughs> times too much, like oh, three hundred dollars oh. a ton. I know, I know. We made a lot of it, right? Um, <laughs> no, no. So you know, of course, Sutter Home. Uh, and Bob Pinchero did a presentation. He said, everybody laughed at me. He said they laughed at me. But I had the trucks lined up down Highway 29 to load White Zinfandel. And I bottled it that morning. It loaded in that afternoon. It went to the consumer. And I went to the bank. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. <laughs> okay, Bob, you made your point. Um, so... White Zinfandel saved the old vines, created an awareness about the grape. It, it really was, um, you know, a great thing. But uh, moving forward, you want to talk about? Uh, I'd like to hear. I'd like to hear um, about the uh, grand tasting. I know that that's the event that most people are are able to attend. Um, Let me so, tell you about the first one. Remember the first one, Joel? I do yeah. remember the first was one. That, yeah. We had that was it, at, like the library in no, Fort Mason. No, that was at the Mandarin Oriental. Was no, that? no, it was at the Federal Reserve Bank. In wow, it was in three Coast different Coast. places. <laughs> yeah. 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 Remember that one? The yeah. Federal Reserve Some of the wineries <laughs> never got visited because they were behind these pillars and they could find them. But I heard we, that story about our wine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had all this food. We were behind a pillar. We had, you know, baby lamb chops and bok choy and all. Of, yeah, I mean, we spent all our our whole budget on food, and we got like uh, 30 customers and 15 trade or something. And at, we had that meeting afterwards. We we were broke. We were basically broke. So we're still broke. Yeah. <laughs> we went, Labor and love. We went to, changes. And That's next, why we're a nonprofit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> didn't start that That's way. That's true. This isn't uh, Are we uh, having fun? Not for profit. <laughs> yes, yes, we are having fun. No, no. And, you know, and then next year we said, all right, we'll make it smaller. We'll go to Lenise. We went to Green's Restaurant over there at, at Fort Mason, and we were so crowded. We had Ridge, Ravenswood, Rosenblum, everybody in one corner, and it was people almost got trampled trying to get there. Uh, and we said, oh, well, this is good. We're not paying for food much. We're doing, you know, and uh, let, let's expand a little bit. And, and then it, it took off. It took off. So, um, you know, we are, 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 you know, we persevered. We're very proud of that. 22 years. That's 22 yep. years. Impressive. And this year, uh, the, uh, this one, the grand tasting is February 2nd from 2 to 5 p.m. So we can get that out there. That right. grand we, tasting. We, for a long time, we sort of put it on the last weekend in January. I used to used to call it the uh, it's Super Bowl weekend. Yeah, it's right. it yeah. Is. We used to we used to call it Super Glass Saturday and Super Bowl Sunday. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I do have a question. Um, how many wineries are going to be at the Zap? And uh, and uh, for people that have never been there before, um, how? Should they tackle the testing? Oh, I mean, um, what, very, know. very carefully. I would, I would go with. Uh, I believe the official answer so far is we're over 20 wineries already signed up to participate. Um, how to tackle it? I'll pass it off to other people. My plan every year is to uh, 
walk in and go to seven wineries I've never either heard of or that I haven't tried in the last five years or so because it's a fantastic event. It's a great, it, it's got great energy. It, it's so much fun to see all these different styles of Zinfandel because as you said, as you go through, every single one of these wines is completely different. It still has that core Zinfandel love of deliciousness, but they have different expressions of that. And pick a winery you've never heard of. If it's your first time, go to your favorites. Check out the very newest things, but then try at least a couple of wines, wineries that you've never heard of because you never know. It may be your brand new favorite, or it may be the one where you go, okay, yeah, that was, that was nice. Right. And well, then move on. Yeah, but and that's, here, that's here, great. Chris, here's the, the really neat thing. Is people have never been here before, don't know. Uh, you go in, you have a glass, to, you, give, you get a glass, you know, right? And then you go and you, and get, you get a loaf of bread. Too. You get a whole baguette. <laughs> Good thing. <laughs> Good thing. We got, you know, 10,000 people walking around with baguettes in their hands. It's, it's amazing. Um, it's a lot and, of bread. <laughs> you got to have something to soak up that booze. Or you oh, make it man. Day, right? Yeah, but the best approach, I, I think, Ian, is the team. Yeah. Get 10 of your best friends. Uh, you take A to D. You take care. You take care. You take care. You meet up in the center with your half-eaten bread and whatever else is going on. Drink a lot of What did food. you like, you know? And then you take a note, and then your friends go, try that. Uh, then you meet again, and you narrow it down. Um, and in the past, we've had two pavilions. So if you can even get to two, you're, you're really lucky. Uh, but the views, are, views would be great. <laughs> Uh, now we're at the pavilion, and so everybody's under one roof, one carpeted. It's really nice. It's soft, um, and uh, so the team effort is is kind of worthwhile. Great. I and so, would would you um, tell us? Is there is there a website people can, can go to to get some of this information? And secondarily, where exactly are all of these events? So we've got um, the Grand Tasting is the concourse which is at 8th and Brannan in San Eighth Francisco. Brandon. Okay, 8th and Brannan. Um, for those of you who've been to our old location down at Fort Mason, um, one of the benefits of the concourse is it is carpeted. All the wineries are in one room, and it's quieter, Yeah. yeah. which is so nice. I know <laughs> I had my voice at the end of the yeah. event last year, yeah. which is for 21 years you didn't have your voice. Didn't no, you? Like, yeah. it's like if you were totally wrong. Yeah. Because you're yelling at people. Sunday, you just spent the entire day trying to, you know, doing, you know, doing. You couldn't yell at the Super Bowl, and, uh, right? Yeah. Yeah, and just yeah. kind of going, uh. It's funny, the, the little things that you notice, you know, standing and talking to people for hours, whatever, it's what we do. Not having to scream at people the entire time <laughs> really was nice. I bet. Um, it, 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 it's, a, it's a cool space. Um, like Kent said, the views across the bay at Fort Mason were pretty stunning. But the, the, the event hall that we're in now is, is, I think, better for the event that we have. Okay. Um, and other than bread, are there other, are there other foods for people to sample? Or? Yes, luckily. Well, I mean, there's, um, we've got, there's a whole big, huge uh, trays of cheeses and delicious. Olive meat. oils. Yes. And, uh, okay, all kinds of stuff. Different, well. different so stuff. We, we, we're great wine, great wine, great views. Of you. I mean, killing yeah, and usually caterers in the back, uh, sir, if you want to get a little more enthusiastic and, you know, have a taco or a and that, or and, 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 and at that place, we're close to the mission, so if you want to run out to a taqueria, it's not a bad spot. And, you know, right? And not only is there the event on the floor where there, to answer your question, sir, approximately 300 wineries are pouring on an average of three wines a piece. Uh, so that's about 900 wines. So you need to be able, you know, Selective. Yeah, you know, for me, it's kind of social. I go back and I go around, and talk to people that I haven't seen for a while. You know, taste their wines, and then, you know, as with Chris, I look for the wine I've never heard of before because you know they're they're going to be the next great thing out there. I mean, there's a chance to actually, you know, get on board with people before they're actually well known. Yeah. You know, right. So which is which is great. So there there are really interesting things to do. There are lectures going on. Okay. All during the day, there'll be like 
two or three winemakers getting up talking about a particular topic at the particular lecture room, pouring some wine for, I think, it's like 20 minute segment. So mm -hmm. everybody gets a chance to do that. So, so there's a lot going on. You can, and there's a lounge you can take a break in if, you don't, if you're tired of uh, walking around baby. and drinking. No. You can uh, like no, this. No, 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 no nap taking, please. <laughs> no, 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 it's, it's just no. what, one day? No, no nap. Okay, so if you only have one day, no naps. No nap. Maybe lots of bread. But I want to know, uh, you guys as winemakers yourselves, what are your favorite wines that you have tasted at this event? It's not your own. <laughs> That's an unfair question. We, I don't think so. I, don't know. We, I want the inside scoop, guys. Come on, help me uh, out. We, it, it changes all the time. Yeah. I mean, well, we're, of course, we're, but we're, what we're, was it last we're, year? We're, we're professionals. Yes. We taste wine all the time. We and we while we like wine and we drink wine and we appreciate wine. So you're for us, three. It's, for us, it's a much more academic exercise yeah. than that. Okay. Well, let me, let me expound. On Are we that. allowed to have uh, favorites? I don't know that I we're allowed so. to have favorites. Yeah. 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 I know yeah. how you're not usually like okay. pushed One, two, three. <laughs> you know, I'm done. Like, don't be a You are. Way to pull out the twist. Look, I always tell people like you, you know, that when I make wine, I don't give a shit which of my wines you like. It doesn't matter. You know, my job as a winemaker is to make the wine that is true to the vineyard. It's not a wine that I think is going to, you know, score highly. It's going to please somebody. It's going to please me that I've actually, you know, translated that vineyard correctly or that I've made the best wine I could make. Get out a rock wall. It's not going to please everybody. I mean, let's face it, all these wines that we have on the table are different. You're going to like some of them more than you're going to like others of them. What I like is irrelevant, honestly. Uh, but whether I've done a good job of making a wine is the most relevant thing. All right, here, yeah, let, all right, guys, let me let me fill it up. I've done my best to persuade you from your question. All right, all right. I can tell you. I can tell you. Here, here's what I do. Um, I go around and uh, when I get, you know, I'm, I'm I got a lot of people here, so I go around and I taste all these wines and. Uh, I, I probably have 200, 300 people come and ask me, uh, well, what do you think is good? You know, and so I will tell them, here's my two or three favorites. So um, in the last few years, um, you know, the, the first year Carlisle was there, uh, I went over and I tasted that wine. I said, man, that's great stuff. And one year Brown family was there. I said, you guys are doing a great job. When your green and red was doing a great job. So I tell people, and then all of a sudden, 200 people show up at this guy's table, see. And, <laughs> and, and they brought a case. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and, they're, and they're gone. Yeah, yeah. so uh, these face. people years later come tell me, well, Kent, that was the greatest recommendation I ever got. All these people, you know, now we sell out on the mailing list, all that stuff. And I'm saying, geez, I wish I could do that for myself. <laughs> you know, I think an interesting approach is, like, literally, you put your ear to the ground. And you can hear what the buzz is. Because, yes. you know, the Ravenswoods, the, the, the Arbs, the, the Rosenblum, Raffinelli doesn't do it anymore. But, you know, there's yeah. the big some, names. The Morrison's because he won't say it. They're, yeah, they're the always going to be yeah. swamped. They're always going to be swamped. But every year it's there is, there's this new winery, or maybe it's not even new. Like last year, I remember, you know, Limerick Lane. I mean, it was mm -hmm. phenomenal. I mean, the, yeah, people a, were rushing yeah. the Limerick Lane. Incredible winery that's yeah. been around forever, under new ownership, still has these historical vineyards. Mm -hmm. And under this new ownership, I mean, they've crafted these incredible wines. I mean, it was the buzz last year. So there's always something really neat like that. And it may be a brand new brand that's, you know, introducing, you know, wine or just getting in the field, or it's someone who's rediscovered something. But there's always a buzz. And I mean, literally, it doesn't take listening very hard to figure out what it is. And so I think that's what I like to do. Is I like to hear, what's everybody talking about? What's everyone excited about? Why are they excited about that wine? And go try it. And it's also listening to what I always tell everyone who asks me what my favorite is, because you don't care what my favorite yeah. is. Because that's my taste, not yours. Um, that's true. So... But you're a winemaker. You, yeah, you've got yeah. a, you know, yeah. but, palette, but, but, special you palette. Have to know, everyone knows yeah. the two flavors in wine. I like it. I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> tell and, me what kind of style you like. You know, it, it's, it's, it's actually a little yeah. more complicated than that. It turns out that 
Somebody has done this whole study where they've compressed red wine drinkers into four categories. Yeah, oh, there's oh, the yes, there's I the can hear a spin an old there, story. Coming. There's the balance. Oh, there's, the, there's the balance category. These we people got 40 minutes in. These people don't like any structure in their wine, but they like them soft, they like them balanced, they like them to taste good, not too much oak, not too much sugar. Yeah, yeah. And then there's the there's something called the winemaker category because winemakers gravitate to it. They like acid, they like tannin, they like you know like yes, we do. Know, high tone aromatics. <laughs> and then there's the what I call the vegetative category. This is a group of people who likes wines that smell like herbs. It doesn't matter whether it's the herbs out of Lodi <laughs> or the herbs from Cabernet. They think that that's the one thing that binds them together. They don't care whether the wine's oaky or whether it's sweet or anything else. And then there's the new category in the world, the one that's serviced by apothic reds and things like that. It's the sweet category. It's the people who like between 9 and 14 grams of residual sugar in the red wine. Winemakers hate those wines. But the truth of the matter is that there are people who love those wines. So hey, there, there's like we are the Pepsi range. generation. Yeah, there's a whole <laughs> range of possible. Well, that represents only like 30 percent of the drinking population, but it's still a pretty big category. If, if you can't make the this great event that's coming up at the end of the month, how else can you learn about it? Like Pinot, Pinot Report, and different things. How else can people that are maybe watching just now? aren't fortunate enough to live in the Bay Area and come and visit us. How can they learn about Zinfandel? Great question, and thank you. Um, you can go to Zinfandel.org, which is Zap's website, and hopefully on there, as I look into the camera and look at the people at the Zap office, yeah. <laughs> uh, Hi, Becky. you can find, hi, um, you can find all kinds of fun things, great Zinfandel history information, a Zinfandel aroma wheel, all kinds of wonderful things to help you understand this grape that the four of us and everyone else in California who makes Zinfandel and loves it so much um, want to share with you. Uh, and and we've got, we were down to about five minutes here, and I'd like to use this time to talk about myself. So uh, Good. <laughs> I'd, like, I'd, like, I'd like to thank you all for coming. Good, I'll start drinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With, with only a couple minutes left, um, I'd, if you could just really quickly recap uh, the, the events that are available and the time and uh, when people can go if you have more, I'm happy to do it um, so that the audience can hear and remember. We've got uh, we've got the Epicurio, we've got the flight, go down? Yeah, yeah. winemaker I'll, dinner, I'll, and the you Grand You do Epicurio, I'll do flights, uh, you do the main event? Um, yeah, just real quick. Okay, so um, uh, flights is on uh, Friday. Mm -hmm. uh, the flights first. is a, uh, uh, an event, uh, which is an educational event. We have uh, four winemakers and myself all talking about historic vineyards in California and tasting those historic vineyards. So you really get a sense of what happened a long time ago and why Zinfandel is so important to California. And then working slightly backwards, Thursday evening is Epicuria. It's a pairing of 50 wineries with 50 restaurants. Each Zinfandel is matched with a wonderful food ranging from my restaurant, uh, Taste Restaurant in Plymouth, which is just spectacular, recent James Beard Award winner, Go Taste, um, uh, um, is doing a smoked duck with my Zinfandel, um, all the way from smoked duck to chocolate salad to crazy desserts. It's Dude. fantastic food, great wine, and as we mentioned earlier, limited Limited group size, so you have lots of time to talk to everybody. It's a spectacular event. Thursday night of, of Zap. Okay. You can talk about All right. Well, we're, we actually You're have... You're on Saturday the, now. No, no. Uh, I'm going to let Clay do that, but we have the <laughs> Friday night Oh, yeah. Dinner, dinner with the winemakers. Ooh. Dinner with the winemakers with special tastings of reserve wines coming up, and you can sign up to get their early have a special, uh, you know, kind of reserve tasting. And then uh, if you sign up later, you get to come in and we have this great dinner. Uh, it's at what, the Mark Hopkins, is it? Mm -hmm. uh, hotel. It's at the Fairmont. And Fairmont. Special Fairmont. It's, it's at the Fairmont. Fairmont. It's Fairmont. It's at the top of the hill. At the Fairmont. At the, at the top of the hill. At Fairmont. At the keep yep. changing it. Okay. It's the Fairmont. Uh, Next to the Mark Hopkins, but at the Fairmont. But if you get to the Mark Hopkins, you're close. Okay. <laughs> there you go. You'll find it. Uh, all right. And, right over there. Yeah, uh, there will be winemakers at every table uh, with special wines, special gifts for yeah. people that sign up. And it's not only a really fun dinner, 
uh, there's this auction where there's stuff you guys can have. And the auction uh, proceeds go to support the uh, Zinfandel Heritage Vineyard Foundation, which is a, a thing Zap set up to preserve old clones of Zinfandel. Uh, and I think we have, what, 30, 40 old clones we've propagated? Well, we started, we started with 90. We're propagating 20. Well, we're okay. And, we're, are, yeah. and, and we are pushing uh, about 13 of them. Yeah, to the so this is a really special project uh, that Zap has put hundreds of thousands of dollars into uh, via this auction. And, it, and it's a really fun night. Oftentimes, the auctioneers are so much fun you can't stand it. And there's a band and dancing, and it's, it's really good. Um, then, by the time you wake up Saturday morning, there's... Saturday is the, uh, the grand tasting, the big event. Um, nearly 300 wineries, as Joel said, some of them pouring three to eight different, different Zinfandels. So you literally have nearly 1,000 Zinfandels to try. Um, it's at the concourse at 8th and Brandon. It's just a, an amazing event. You know, that, uh, I think it's the largest variety focused you know, wine event in the world. I mean, it's pretty awesome. Yeah. It is, it is. So again, um, those are all the things that are going down. This is the 22nd annual Zap Festival, January 31st to February 2nd. The website again for everyone? Zinfandel.org. Where you can learn all about this festival, about Zinfandel in general. And uh, gentlemen, uh, would you go around the room or one more time, tell us who you are, what you do, and, uh, and call it a night. And my name is Clay Mortson. I'm the winemaker at Mortson Winery. Uh, Ken Rosenblum, I'm the CEO, Director of Production, Rockwall Wines, and also formerly Rosenblum, Cellars, in, Al in Alameda. I'm Chris Lamey, I'm the winemaker for Terra de Oro and Montevino Wineries in Amador County. And I'm Joel Peterson, and I'm the founding winemaker at Ravenswood Winery. All right, well, thank you all for tuning in. It was a pleasure having you. Again, go to Zap. Get zapped January 31st, February 2nd. You got all the information. Get zapped. All, all right, Ian. Get zapped. Man, you got it. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you, guys. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Toast. Toast. Right. And we didn't even talk about the wine. <laughs>